Hi, uh, welcome to our Advocate video podcast. I'm Emily Toman, editor of the Far North Dallas Advocate magazine, and I'm here with public, our publisher, Rick Wamri. Hey. And, uh, and today we're going to be talking with District 12 Councilman Ron Natinsky, who is running for mayor uh, in this upcoming election against uh, former P Chief of Police David Kunkel and Park Board President Mike Rawlings, who will also be inviting to come and speak with us later on. Um, Councilman Natinsky, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Glad to be with you. Well, we'll start by asking, um, what solutions do you have for the problems that Dallas faces, like the city budget crisis, that maybe other people haven't had since you've been on the council this, this entire time? Well, you know, actually Dallas, while, you know, we're in an economic uh, financial crisis, I guess a lot of people compare it to what's happened to the Depression of 29, but when you look at the city of Dallas as compared to other cities, we're really not doing that bad. Uh, I have the privilege of serving on the Board of Directors of the National League of Cities, so I meet with a lot of my counterparts across the city. And while, you know, we may have be in the position of having to trim a few hours here and, and we've got some furlough days, uh, and you cut back on services, which are all painful to us when you compare what's happening to other cities where they're literally closing their libraries, laying off their half their fire department, laying off their cops, cutting back on literally all kinds of things. Uh, those of us that are fortunate enough to live in Dallas have not had to feel some of that pain. Uh, I think this upcoming budget year is going to have some, uh, you know, some issues that we're going to have to face. There's obviously not going to be enough money to go around. But I think that those are things that if we manage the city properly, we have a good chance of dealing with them and uh, providing the services that everybody expects. Now, this year's budget crisis versus last year's budget crisis, which one is worse? And then what you said earlier about some of the pain we didn't feel, some would argue that that's because we raised taxes last year. I know you weren't in favor of that, but Absolutely that's what not. some are going to say. That that's what, we didn't feel as much pain because we went out and spent some more money out of people's pockets. Well, yeah, I mean, I meant pain from the perspective of even when the proposed budget was, was laid out by the city manager, some of the cuts were just nowhere near as severe as what other cities are having to feel and not imaginarily feel, I mean, really feel. Uh, the you know the city only gets its its money from two sources. You've got sales tax and you've got uh, ad valorem taxes on property. The other things that the city gets in the way of fees and other you know uh, small amounts of money don't really add up to very much. So when you've got a down economy and you have people not spending their money, we're not collecting that one penny on every dollar that we're used to spending. The other piece of it is the real estate taxes. Property values go down. The amount of money that the city collects goes down. Now, last year we were very fortunate. Property values uh, only dropped around three and a half percent at a commercial value, and only and basically held their own on a residential value. So we didn't feel a lot of what's happening in other cities, where you're seeing thirty and forty percent of the real estate value just drop out of the bottom of the market. Now, having watched city budgets for a number of years, you have the budget that's proposed by the city manager, but preceding that, you hear the projections of where the city's going to be. Last year, we started out, I think, north of $130 million theoretical shortfall. By the time we got around to adopting it before the uncalled for pricing uh, tax increase, we had narrowed that margin down to the between 20 and 30, depending on what you wanted to leave in there. Uh, and so the, the problem with that is, is we've had several years where we've been cutting and trying to economize and do things more efficiently, and I sort of use the analogy of like a turkey at Thanksgiving. The first day, there's a lot of meat on the turkey. The second day, there's less. Pretty soon, you get down to the bone, and it's very, very difficult. So our projected shortfall this year of, of somewhere around north of $30 million pales in comparison to past years, but we've already done a lot of the things to fix the budget in these past years, so you can't redo them again. So are you um, going to be against a tax increase are you, are you, will you never, will you not raise taxes even, even if it comes down to it in the, going into this next budget? Well, I, when you say never, uh, I voted against it this last time. Mm -hmm. I thought there were other things that we could do to bring to the table to provide the level of services that we needed in the city without going out and raising the tax rate uh, at that time. Uh, I'm hoping that as we go through the budget and we scrub it, we have found a lot of things that we're doing over the years that are bringing ex additional revenue to us. We've got a lot of things that we're doing a lot more efficiently today than what we did four or five years ago, uh, and $30 million in the scheme of a, you know, an over-billion-dollar operating budget is really not a lot of money. I mean, it, 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 it's money, but it's, you know, it, 
So uh, as for this year, you're not too worried. Well, I'm like. worried. No, I mean, I, I don't think it's going to be a cakewalk. I think it's going to take a lot of work to get to that point. But I'm, you know, I'm willing to roll my sleeves up and work at it to the point. Uh, you know, for example, we we installed a GPS system in our garbage trucks. It saved us eight hundred thousand dollars this year. And I know, you know, it's eight hundred thousand here, and it's a million there, and it's a half a million here, and pretty soon you're talking, you know, serious savings that we don't have to go out and. Uh, compute into the tax rate that, that we have on the citizens. Uh, you know, we've got several revenue generating ideas that we're floating around, and every year we've managed to implement some of those. And so you have to be cognizant of what you do. The reason I'm saying never, I mean, if there was just some catastrophic situation out there mm -hmm. and we were faced with uh, laying off officers or doing something that I think would maintain long-term pain to the city, I would certainly entertain it, but I think that's probably not on the horizon. You, uh, you've stated on your website that um, the majority of citizens agree with your uh, stance on the tax increase. Um, which study are you referring to? Uh, during the last time, we talked to citizens all over the city of Dallas, and uh, you know there was not a part of the city that was untouched. You know when we polled them and said, you know, are you in favor of raising taxes or not? Uh, it's been a tight economy. You've got people that are being laid off from jobs. Uh, you know there's serious you know consequences to things like that. And uh, to just go out there and, you know, I guess you have to separate your needs from your wants. Uh, and, you know, individually people have to live within their budgets. Uh, fortunately, the city charter says we're going to have a balanced budget each year. So unlike the federal government, we just, you know, we don't overspend. But when you go in and do that, you're also working on a lot of assumptions. Uh, you're going out and you're projecting what the sales tax is going to be cumulatively over the next 12 months. You're going out and projecting what your costs are going to be, uh, you know, the cost of gasoline, it's spiked in the last uh, couple of weeks. It's gone up 75 cents a gallon. Well, the city buys a lot of gasoline, and those things affect us. Cost of electricity. So sometimes people don't really think about all the costs of doing business, and as our cost of doing business as a city goes up, those are expenses that we have to cover. Um, we, uh, we're working on building a $500 million convention center hotel and uh, also with the Trinity Toll Road, and, um, what we, and but at the same time we can't afford some of our essential street repairs and keeping rec centers and libraries open regularly and things like that. What's your response to that kind of argument, having supported? Well, if, if you want to, you know, home in on the convention center hotel, uh, it's five hundred and fifty million dollars. We'll throw that extra fifty okay. in there. Sure. Uh, and I was a strong proponent of it. Uh, first of all, it is not being paid for with taxpayer money. It's not, we're not using general fund that we're collecting from the taxpayers on an annual basis to pay for that debt. It's being paid for with revenue bonds. The revenue bonds were, are being repaid by those people who stay in the hotel. The revenues that the hotel generates repay that. So there is a separation in that. A lot of the other projects that the city has going are bond projects, which come out of our you know, capital bond program. Uh, those don't come out of the general fund. Now, obviously, on those, there's debt service that has to be paid as a result of that. Uh, when you talk about the convention center hotel, we used to be number five in the convention business in the United States. We had all the giant conventions were here. The convention business for the city of Dallas is about $2 billion a year and employs about 50,000 people. So we're either, we have to make a choice, a business decision. Are we going to still be in the convention center business or are we going to get out of it? And our decision was that we needed to be in it, that strategically where we're located in the United States is good for convention sites. We have one of the largest convention centers in the country, a million, over a million square feet in our convention center. So the one thing that we didn't have was a convention center hotel. The people that wanted to come here said, unless you get a convention center hotel, we're, we're crossing Dallas off your list. I mean, without re-debating that whole yeah. thing, I mean, should we be worried that no private sector person wanted to step up and build well, it? We've tried for 30 years, and the question is, how long do you keep trying before you, you make the decision that you want to be in? We dropped from number five down to number, I think, 16. How much lower do we want to go, and how many more weeks do we want the convention center empty? But is the marketplace telling us something that we waited 30 years and nobody else wanted to put the money out? Well, uh, let's put it this way. We built the hotel. It's, it's getting close to com being completed later this year. It's not even finished yet. And our bookings over the first three years are already exceeding the projections that we needed to cash flow the bonds on the hotel. So I think the market is responding. The customer said, we'll come if you get a convention center hotel. 
The other is you've got other hotels in the area that have gone in and renovated themselves, getting ready for the increase in business. We're having new hotels open. We have two new ones on the horizon right now that are going into completion. We've got a third one on the way. So the business is there, and what you're doing is you're putting 50,000 people and you're keeping them busy, and you're going to grow that back to 100,000 that we used to have working in that industry. And our $2 billion worth of business will grow to 2.5 to 3, you know, over the incremental time. Remember, convention business is long lead time business. People don't spur the moment decide that next year I'm going to go to Dallas. These are decisions that are made out four or five years in the future or more. Now, as long as we're talking about the hotel and the bridge and all that, I, I just wanted to read you a quote that I, I saw Jim Schutz and the Observer had written. And actually, I, I found the link on your, uh, on your campaign website. And just see what you think of this. <coughs> this is Schutz now writing. I think the Cal... Schutze, right. I think the Caltrava signature bridge over the Trinity River and the Arts District downtown and the new deck park over the Woodall Rogers Freeway are all a bunch of useless ego trips for old, out-of-it rich people, and they will do nothing to build the future of the city. Well, as a journalist, uh, Jim has his opportunity to have his opinion. I don't agree with that. Uh, if you want to go, if you want to crank it back a little bit, if we didn't have some vision with big projects, we wouldn't have built TFW Airport. And where would we be today? DFW has turned into the third busiest airport in the world. It's one of the keys. It's really the heart of our economy right now. And without it, we, would be, we wouldn't be where we are. But how do you uh, balance the vision projects with the potholes and the cops and everything well, else? Well, first of all, uh, let's talk about potholes. Our service level on potholes in the city of Dallas is 24 hours. The only reason potholes don't get filled in the city of Dallas is somebody doesn't call in to report them. So we got plenty of money. We've got, we've got whatever we need. We've got money. We've got asphalt. We've got guys on trucks. We've got, and we, and we, we monitor this. I mean, we've got a service that we, that we expect to provide, and potholes happen to be a 24-hour service. You call on Monday, it's fixed on Tuesday. Okay? Now, I'm not sure that, we, that the citizens really expect a higher level of service. I'm not sure that we need 6- or 12-hour pothole service. Uh, street maintenance, we pour, you know, we pour a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars into street maintenance. Uh, to keep them up so you don't have the pothole, you know, issue. Uh, there's a lot of things that the city does that sometimes when you live here, you, you don't appreciate, you know, some of the things that are going on. But you, so you're kind of thinking, or at least as far as what you're saying here, is garbage, potholes. And for the most part, we're getting the services that we're paying for. Well, I mean, the basic, the basic goal of government, I mean, we're, we're sort of like a business in a way. Our, our, our goals are different. In a, in a private business, you, you know, you, it's about investor return and equity and, and uh, you know, profits and so forth. Uh, we have 13,000 people that work for the city of Dallas, and our goal is to provide basic essential governmental services to the citizens. Police protection, fire protection, garbage pickup, clean water, safe streets, all those sorts of things. Uh, you mentioned police earlier. Uh, our crime rate this year so far is down over 15 percent over last year. Violent crime is down over 25 percent. Our crime rate in the city of Dallas, and I grew up here. I'm, I'm, I'm a long You've time. Been here a while. Been here a while. It, it's lower than it was in 1960. So now you're starting to sound like Mayor Leopard. Well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I don't know. I think Mayor Leopard's done a good job for the city. 